welcome everyone uh, to this uh, coordinated access webinar. We're super glad you can all be with us today. And this is not only a coordinated uh, or sorry, a case conferencing uh, webinar. It's a by name listing coordinated access action oriented case conferencing webinar. And I'm super excited about that. Uh, when I was working in community, like knew that case conferencing was really important, but we just really struggled, couldn't figure out how to get it to be a meeting that felt like really useful and productive. And uh, folks from Community Solutions uh, Built for Zero in the US have really been leaning into this and have come up with some approaches and resources that I think will be really helpful. So I'm excited about sharing those with you today. My name is Marie Morrison. I'm the director of Built for Zero Canada with the Canadian Alliance to End Homelessness. And I have with me the amazing Lisa Bell, Improvement Advisor, who is going to be monitoring the chat and the questions. Uh, and you'll be hearing from her throughout the presentation as well. The Canadian Alliance to End Homelessness leads a national movement of individuals, organizations, and communities working together to end homelessness in Canada. So we're going to go through a few sort of like housekeeping slides here. I want you to know that all the webinars uh, uh, that we do, uh, both past and present, are available here on the Training and Technical Assistance website. So you'll be able to find this presentation after here. And that we are funded uh, for this work to support communities with by name list and coordinated access as part of the CCI funding stream of Reaching Home. And to know that today's webinar is being recorded and we will send that recording out later to all those who registered. It will also be posted on the website, as I mentioned, under webinars, under archived webinars. Everyone is muted, but we will be asking you throughout to use the chat uh, and we'll be asking you some questions through the chat and uh, encourage you to also ask questions uh, through either the chat or the Q&A function as we go through and we will have time for questions. But really wanted to start with a poll to understand your experience and interest in case conferencing. And so we're gonna do that poll now. So uh, Lisa, can you tell me, is the poll showing up on the screen? It is, yep. Amazing, so are you seeing the first question? What is your interest in attending this webinar? Or are both questions showing up? Both questions are showing up. So the uh -oh. first about interest and the second about exposure to case conferencing to date. Oh, perfect. That's great. I can see people filling both of those out. We've got about 27, 20, 30 of uh, the 60 who've participated. So we'll give folks a, a little bit longer till we're up closer to the number of folks that are on the webinar. Oh, we're getting close. We're up to 50 of 62. So if you haven't had a chance yet to uh, weigh in on what is your interest in attending this webinar and what has been your exposure to case conferencing to date. All right, it looks like we are there and I'm just going to share the results with folks. So interestingly, uh, Lisa, can you see the results now? I can. Oh, amazing. Okay, so we've got about an equal mix of people who are joining because they're curious to learn more um, and are maybe wanting or ready to start and those who maybe have case conferencing are looking to improve it. And then we've got, again, a bit of a mix of folks who have heard about it, uh, some who have maybe participated in some training, a very small number. We've got some people who have observed, some have participated, and that's great. We've got about 12 people on the line who've actually facilitated case conferencing. So it will be interesting to hear from you and your questions, et cetera. All right. We are moving on. Thank you everyone for sharing. So what will we be covering today? Uh, we're going to talk generally about case conferencing, what it is and isn't, and why do it. We're going to talk about how this conversation is evolving about action-oriented case conferencing, both in Canada and the U.S. 
and we are going to dig into some information about action-oriented case conferencing and uh, share some resources introducing you to the case conferencing tool bank and we're going to be working through sort of these three uh, areas or uh, sort of this framework and there's going to be sort of five action steps within this that you can take within your community. What I'm hoping that you will get out of the session, I'm hoping that when you leave you have caught the case conferencing bug, that you are leaving inspired to implement and improve case conferencing in your community, that you're leaving with some actionable ideas, and that you know where you can find more information and resources. So let's dig into what it is and isn't and some of the benefits. And I want you as we're just looking at this slide to put in the chat what words stand out for you when you see this. Successful coordinated access systems are supported by consistent action-oriented community case conferencing meetings. Case conferencing is a routine centralized process that helps monitor and advance progress of people on your binding list coordinated access priority list. Let's assume that's all one list with just uh, some different subsets to it towards housing and regular meetings that allow for support coordination and problem solving to occur with all community partners who are serving people experiencing homelessness in your community. So if you can put in some of those words that are really standing out for you there, Lisa, what are you seeing in the chat? I'm seeing uh, routine as a word that sticks out. Um, also coordination and problem solving action oriented, all awesome, juicy words that stand out for me as well. I see centralized uh, being repeated, action oriented being repeated, um, consistent or ongoing, as well as um, advanced progress um, in terms of advancing okay. towards ending chronic homelessness. Um, also, Mona has a great point. What stood Amazing. out for her was all community partners. Um, so really think she's really thinking about how the process can incorporate all of those who are involved in your coordinated access system. Perfect. Those are great words. And so some other things I would sort of lift out for people that it is interagency. So it involves more than one provider that it is client-centered, that the purpose of the meeting is to discuss housing people experiencing homelessness on your list and that you're using that list to generate the agenda and that it's for frontline staff, those people who are working directly with people experiencing homelessness, they are the primary participants in your meeting. Sometimes I think it's helpful to lift out like really clearly what case conferencing is not. It is not an administrative meeting. Uh, it is not a meeting about agency and system updates. It's not a meeting to simply to discuss how to improve someone's well-being while homeless so that just managing homelessness. It is not clinical case conferencing. And what I mean by that is it's not people sort of brought up in the moment. It is not uh, the very hardest cases being brought forward and discussed for the majority of the meeting. It is not a matching only meeting, although the matching may be a part or a sub meeting uh, that occurs within your community. And it is not case conferencing, this by nameless case coordinated access uh, case conferencing we're talking about is not wraparound support or service sort of coordination once someone is housed. Uh, that may be very important, but what we're talking about is moving people from homelessness to housing. So I want you now to use the chat to share what you think some of the benefits of case conferencing are or can be. Lisa, I see the chat lighting up there. What, what are we hearing from people, some of those benefits? Yeah, so we're hearing uh, interdisciplinary, the benefits of being able to share best practices amongst providers, having that multi-sector approach, um, the benefits of coordinated access related to prioritization. Um, the lovely Michelle is saying the benefit of getting people matched with correct programs and services. Um, an opportunity to share knowledge, resources, 
manpower, share expertise, provide wraparound support, and creating a level of accountability for all agencies that are involved with a particular client. Um, and also some knowledge contributions from all team members. So an opportunity to kind of share what you know and branch that out with other folks who are joining the table. And uh, last but not least, we have the uh, avoidance of duplication of services. Mm, yeah, those are good ones. And I think people have hit on most of those ones I would have listed as well about being coordinated, um, you know, really being able to lift out from everyone around the table, sort of progress and barriers, uh, and to think about some of those systemic barriers and be able to uh, strategize solutions can help to someone mentioned duplication of service it can help to clarify roles and responsibilities and as said too, to support your overall goals to reduce and end homelessness and I think really it's about building uh, this team as people said this multidisciplinary team that can really do some problem solving so those are great things people shared and so I wanted just to review a little bit about how we've been talking about case conferencing and the evolution of this idea of action-oriented case conferencing, starting with what we hear from Reaching Home about case conferencing, uh, what's part of Built for Zero, the Canadian Alliance, and then what is emerging from Community Solutions, our friends in the U.S. So if you look at the Reaching Home Coordinated Access Guide, where you will see reference to case conferencing is when they talk about the matching and referral process, and they identify it as one of the um, options or common models. So either the case conferencing model or the shortlist model, which is sometimes referred as the automatic kind of referral model. And then they provide some information about that. And they, you know, as you're thinking about if you're using it for matching and referral, you do before case conferencing, during case conferencing, and ask after case conferencing. But the case conferencing, the way it's mentioned, is really only in the context of matching and referral. When we look at the Canadian Alliance Coordinated Access Scorecard, question number 17 is about case conferencing. And we can see here from the three levels of that scorecard that there's no requirement within reaching home level or the most basic level about coordinated, uh, or sorry, case conferencing. At the basic level, we're looking to see, does your community routinely use a case conferencing process as part of coordinated access that focuses on problem solving and advancing progress of people on your binding list towards housing? And so then if you click on uh, the link there, that takes you into the coordinated access guide, which would then have some resources to help you think about how to do that. And then advanced is thinking about how you're pulling in those kind of outside your typical homelessness response providers. And if there's other case conferencing in your community, how you kind of map and connect to that. But there's not a lot here necessarily around action oriented. What I would say is that there's 18 questions on the scorecard. This is one of them and it's not given any more particular weight than anything else in the scorecard. Our uh, friends with Built for Zero down in the US have really observed that case conferencing is frequently a missed opportunities and that in their work with communities, they have seen that some have figured out how to make it really their immediate path to zero. So though as they've been working with communities, what they have heard often, and I think uh, the folks in the US are more often practicing case conferencing because uh, it's been kind of built in more into their coordinated access system and certain programs require that they do some case conferencing, but that it's often a meeting where not a lot is getting done and the focus tends to be on updates, problems, or brainstorming that is not actionable. But what they learned in their observation and working with communities is that with some action orientation, it can help house people astronomically faster. And we're gonna look at some community examples of that. So here's Chattanooga, when they made their case conferencing action oriented, you can see how that really drove down their number of active homeless veterans on a monthly basis. We see the same thing in Cook County when they started getting really action oriented. And most recently, Abilene, Texas was recognized for reaching and sustaining functional zero on chronic homelessness. And they would attribute a lot of that to their work around their case conferencing. In fact, I attended a presentation where they were speaking about that. And they said together, we got to chronic functional zero in six months, that they did that really by shifting to this action-oriented case conferencing model 
but they did it also without almost any new resources or changing of policies. And it was really the frontline staff who took the lead and through their action-oriented case conferencing really changed their mindsets and habits about how they did their work. And they made some significant gains in reducing the average length of time it takes to move people uh, experiencing chronic homelessness into housing from 188 days on average to 95 days. And so how has this sort of been, again, evolving over time? And it's really over the last uh, year and a half or so. I mean, before this, again, case conferencing was in scorecards. It was, you know, there were some documents that gave tips and tricks and some overview of case conferencing. But it was in March 2019 when the U.S. Uh, Built for Zero folks did a learning session. And they did a breakout specifically on case conferencing. excuse me, and then I had attended that session and I got so excited about it. When we did our next Built for Zero learning session, <clears throat> we also did a breakout. <coughs> but then at the next uh, US learning session in October, they actually made it the entire theme of their learning session and they created a case conferencing action pack. And again, we looked at those resources and we brought it to a session at the uh, Ending Homelessness Conference in 2019 in Edmonton. And then uh, Community Solutions took it even further and they did a whole two day summit and created a tool bank of new resources related to case conferencing just a couple of years ago um, and attended that session and were using this webinar as a way to bring back sort of that most recent learning and uh, resources to you today. So that case conferencing tool bank, you can find on their website. We've got the link there. If you go to resources and then you search case conferencing, then this case conferencing tool bank will come up. We're gonna be highlighting those resources as we go through. But I would also say they are on our website on Built for Zero on the coordinated access uh, toolkit page. If you go to the drop down on coordinated access tools and community examples, you will see a section called action oriented case conferencing and you'll see some of the tools I just mentioned. Um, so the case conferencing tool uh, bank is on there. Uh, we'll need to update some of the other uh, resources to make sure they're all aligned up, but that is hot off the press. And we're going to poll again here, but Lisa, I see the chat sort of heating up and people raising their hands. Is there anything we need to bring forward before we go to the next poll? Um, I think we could wait until the question period, um, if that makes sense. We just have a few questions coming in. Um, yeah. Okay, that's great. So I have launched the next poll. Can you see that there? I can, yeah. Okay, so two questions again. Does your community have case conferencing meetings? And if you do have case conferencing, how often do you have it? That's great, we've got about a third of the people who've answered so far. Great. We'll just give another 20 seconds or so, let a few more people get in there. All right, I'm going to end the poll and share the results here. Can you see the results, Lisa? I cannot see the results. Um, oh, let's there we go. Oh, there we go. Okay, that's great. So 
Uh, in terms of does your community have case conferencing meetings? Yes, and they're totally awesome. So I'm excited as we uh, go through and towards the end, we'd love to hear from folks about things that stood out for them, um, but what is making their meetings totally awesome. Um, we have some that say, yep, we do it, but it's not as productive as I'd like. Yes, some are doing it, but just for one part of the coordinated access process. There looks like there's a number in planning uh, and some have not yet been talking about it. Uh, and if you have case conferencing, how often do you have it? I'm seeing once a month, twice a month, once a week, as needed, none yet. All right. That is helpful. Thank you, everybody. So we're now going to get into the nuts and bolts of this action-oriented case conferencing. So we're going to look go through it in sections, build the team and shared purpose, then how to engineer your meetings for action improvement, and then how to facilitate for action. And again, uh, all of this is largely drawing on this information from Built for Zero and the slides and the information uh, we are using with permission from them. So let's start with building the team and shared purpose. So what makes a case conferencing dream team? Uh, you wanna have folks who uh, are directly, again, working with folks, know the majority of the people on your by name list and can take action steps to house them. Uh, and you're looking to get, you know, kind of a critical mass of providers, but it's not necessarily going to be um, perfection. So aim for 70 plus, uh, it may be more engagement over time. And you're really trying to keep it essential to those who are going to help you achieve your meeting objectives. And we're going to talk more about meeting objectives in a moment. Uh, there is a uh, in partner invitation checklist there. It's uh, sort of heavily US oriented, but you may find it helpful to prompt your thinking around building out your team. And as you think about your team, you want to align that with your by name list coordinated access priority list and ask yourself uh, these questions, whether those who are in the room are could fill each of these roles for each client. So thinking about outreach coordination and not just proper to unsheltered, but anyone or any agency that is engaging or re-engaging people experiencing homelessness in the first steps of the process. Those who might be helping with housing preparedness. Those who are helping with service coordination. Uh, housing stability, so that might be income, health, mental health, addiction folks that are going to be really helping with that, those that help secure subsidies, and those that are housing help or navigators that are going to be helping people to find units and apply for housing. So, you know, just when you think of that, is there folks that are covering that sort of for each client, and is every client covered? So if you've brought people to the table uh, and no one is really connected to the youth sector, for example, but you've got a lot of youth on your binding list and you're trying to talk about them at the table, you might need to think about how are we going to make sure there's people connected for everyone that we have on our list. And when you look at each of the providers around the table, do they fulfill one or more of these roles? When we think of some tips for the team, ideally you would have uh, at least one person from each organization or program who is attending consistently at the case conferencing meetings. It is really hard uh, to move forward when there's a real rotating list of people that aren't as familiar with the, the process or the team uh, coming to the meetings. That ideally this person can be a bridge of communication and they have some knowledge and decision making authority about the resources from their agency. You're trying to make some decisions at the table. Um, are they familiar and can they allocate resources? And if not, do they have uh, like a, a line back to someone at the agency that they can give a quick call to who can help with that? You're looking for people to come prepared to the meeting um, with the most current information on the person allowable to share. This is with the assumption that the list has been updated in advance of the meeting and who you will be discussing at the meeting is known in advance. But again, it can be very frustrating at the table when you go to talk about folks and are like, oh, I don't have that information or I didn't hear about it. Um, 
So being able to come prepared and then to really think about how you'll orient new members. So if you have a by name list, um, you should already have shared consent with that process that you can talk about people around the table. And often uh, case conferencing tables will have providers who come to the table also further sign an oath of confidentiality. And there's some examples on the by name list page under the privacy consent and data sharing. But of course, it's more than that. You're also helping to orient them to the goals uh, and the purpose of being there and sort of the expectations to make sure they can fully participate. And really that participation has two sides of a coin. You can take and look and see if, you know, a couple of meetings have gone by where a participant doesn't have any next action steps, you and they can consider whether it really makes sense for them to be at the table. And on the flip side, if you frequently see next steps like check in with Jenny for status or follow up with Bob, then you might consider adding those folks to your meeting. So the next step, now that we've got our team in place, is to develop some shared purpose. And in developing objectives, there's really two that you want to look at. The content, the what, um, which is going to be really important um, for people to understand sort of why they're at the table and the accountability um, and for measuring your success. And then you also want to look at experiential goals. What is the um, experience that people are having in the meeting? Kind of that mood and tone of the meeting. But further than that, you're going to want to break those objectives into some goals. And we're going to talk more about each of those things now. So more in objectives, when we think of our content objectives, we really recommend that your number one objective should be how can you house people faster. And then you may want to consider another objective or a, a sort of a sub objective, but we really encourage you not to make it more than another one or two when it gets to more than, you know, when you have more than two objectives for a meeting, it's really hard to fulfill uh, that purpose within the meeting. And then you want to think about experiential objectives and you can think about, you know, ones around participation, ones around the mood, uh, ones related to facilitation. And there is a resource that you can use to help set objectives for your meeting and, and to have that sort of facilitated conversation with your team to set those objectives together. When we think about goals, we want to connect the system-wide ending homelessness goals to case conferencing. So the reason and one of the outcomes of that case conferencing is that you are reaching for those system-wide ending homelessness goals. And uh, the case conferencing should not be in isolation and people should be really aware of how they are contributing to those overall goals. But you want to set smaller goals in your meeting that are real and tangible. So for example, to be able to house X number of people in a month. Uh, and there's this target move in data calculator on the case conferencing toolbox, which is really exciting. So if you have inflow and outflow and move in data for the last three months, you can plug that data in and then say, in December, we have 100 people right now on our by name list. If by March, we want to get that down to 80 people, um, it will generate a, a target move in number that your table can use. So it might come out and say 18. If we house 18 people a month, we make that our goal at case conferencing. Um, we should be able to meet that reduction target that you're looking for in your community. The other smaller goal you can look at is how you can reduce average length of time of parts of the process within coordinated access. So from identification to assessment, from assessment to match, from match to housed. And again, when you're looking at, there are resources to help you through that, what are called these buckets of coordinated access. And we're going to talk more about those a little bit later on. All right, we want to talk about some tips for shared purpose. You may have more than one case conferencing meeting, and if so, you're going to want to map the purpose for each of those meetings uh, to detect, you know, overlap and gaps, and there's a grid to do that. And you're going to want to make sure you have objectives and goals for each of those meetings if they're ones that you're running, or just to even understand, again, how it fits into some other tables that are happening in your community. 
you're going to want to develop those goals and objectives together. And again, there is a couple of resources there that can help you think about a facilitated conversation with your team in order to get there. You're going to want to document them somewhere. So whether that's in a terms of reference or on a goals and objectives sheet, but somewhere you want to make sure that those are written down. And you want to keep them front and center. And uh, you can think about whether you put a sheet up on the wall, whether you put the goals and objectives right on your agenda, whether you're reporting back on data to keep them front and center. So how do you help uh, think about, you know, your reason for coming together that that is front and center on people's minds. All right, so we have the team together. Uh, we've got some goals and objectives. Now, how do we set up the meeting so that we can sort of dig into action and improvement? So the first one is to set uh, an agenda for action. And I saw there was a variety of lengths of time that people were meeting and we really recommend meeting frequently once a week or at the most every two weeks. Uh, and that may not be something that your community is used to and people might not be super excited about. It seems like a lot of meetings, but I think when people find that it that it is helping them house people more quickly, they will be uh, finding this one of the most exciting uh, and important meetings of their week. You want to identify with the group who to discuss in advance with a plan to allocate two to three minutes to discuss each client. And you're like, how is that even possible? Uh, there is a, a method to use called the learning loop, and we're going to take a look at that as needed. And it can also be thinking about how many people you're discussing uh, at a meeting. Uh, and there's some different ways to break it down. Sometimes communities wonder, how do we prioritize who we talk about at the table in a, in a one hour time frame? And again, there's, go, there's a tool and a presentation that really talks about how you uh, can think about how to kind of break up your meeting. We're gonna look at a flow chart on that from one of those tools in a minute. And then the other thing is really setting up your binding list um, for action. So adding in some action fields and discussing target move-in dates and these coordinated access buckets. We'll talk a little bit more about that. So here is a decision tree that you'll find in one of those tools that I think helps you just think about how to organize your meetings. So the first question is, do you hold population specific meetings? If the answer is no, you could consider splitting up meetings by population. That will really depend on your community and the services that exist. But you may think, you know, it would be helpful if we did a meeting that just focused on adults and one that focused on youth or families. If you've got a lot of um, population specific services, for example, maybe there is an indigenous specific table. So you can think about how you want to split up by population. And then within that, you can then ask how many people are on your binding list. If it's less than 30 and you feel confident about talking about all those clients in one meeting, maybe it's just that one meeting. If you have more than 30, you might want to consider some different ways to break that down into a manageable number at your meeting. So you could consider <clears throat> splitting up into two or three smaller meetings, and that could occur by a meeting for each housing stage, or even within that meeting, splitting up the time between uh, assessment, matching, and navigation. Or depending on, again, how your community set up, it may make sense to split meetings up by geographic area. You could also consider prioritizing a subset of the list. And there's just some examples there that is not exhaustive. And again, whatever makes the most sense in your community. You might focus on 20 folks this week and a different 20 the next week. Again, just some ways for thinking about how to make those meetings really action-oriented and manageable. And then we talk about using the learning loop to discuss each client and to spark action. And you start with identifying a system barrier. And I've underlined system because uh, this is not a client barrier or an individual barrier. It's what system barrier is preventing them from moving to the next part of the housing process. So what part is keeping them stuck? Is it that they need assessment or they need a unit or they need move-in funds or they need match to a program? So what is that system barrier? 
what is the action step that we can take this week to move them along? So if your action step is three months out, that's probably too long. How can you break that down and make it smaller so that you're taking an action step in the next week? Then you can look at a target move-in date. You know, given what we know, when do we predict they'll move into permanent housing? We'll talk more about uh, this idea of target move-in dates. And then follow-up. Uh, did we take, when you come back to the meeting, did we take that last action set, uh, step? If no, what will we do next? Or what did we learn from that? What are we going to try next? If the answer was yes, again, what did we learn from it? And then starting through the loop again. And what you'll notice from this is that there's really only one quarter of this meeting that is spent on kind of follow-up and updates. The other three quarters is really spent on that forward moving action. Again, to understand more about this, there is a tool about facilitating the learning loop and a whole presentation on it where you can learn more. So that idea of target dates is really for learning. It's making a prediction uh, based on what you know. Uh, it's not, no one's gonna get fired if those uh, dates aren't adhered to, but what they have found in the States is that uh, setting that has really helped kind of amp up and focus some of the learning. So it really builds this culture of accountability for the team. It's a chance to celebrate and think about how can we replicate a success when a client does move in like we predicted, or it can alert you to process bottlenecks when a client is not moving in as predicted. It allows you to provide a double check on your next action step. If your next date is far out, you may want to rethink how can we shrink that step down uh, so it's a way to kind of keep your eye on that and to help forecast housing move-in rates. So you can count how many folks are targeted to move in for the next 30 days to get an, an estimate of your housing move-in. So for example, you may uh, have an, a sort of a goal within your group to house 18 people over the next uh, month or each month you're trying to house 18 people but you see when you look at your estimates that you're only planning or thinking that you're going to house 16. So you can kind of double back and say, hey, is there anyone else that we can move up some of these steps so that we can reach that goal of housing 18 people? And again, there is a whole resource uh, talking about target move-in dates and a guide for, for that. So you can also think about your coordinated access pros, progress um, by buckets. And they have found that these are sort of the most common, uh, you know, buckets that everyone would find in their community. They also have found that looking at these three um, is really helpful. You may name them differently. You may add in another one, but they really do suggest that you keep that to four or five max, because otherwise it's pretty easy for your team to lose the thread of what's going on. So they really recommend these three. And the next step would be to add in your action steps. So once you've identified someone, the bucket of assessing, which could include getting consent, completing an assessment, uh, might be collecting housing needs and preferences. The next bucket, once you've got your assessment completed, is uh, they would be in match. Uh, so, and when we think of match, not just to uh, a unit, but you can think about matching to a resource. So it could be a unit or a subsidy. It could be a program like Housing First or Rapid Rehousing that's going to help someone to find housing. Or it could be that they've been matched uh, to a housing plan uh, and they're more self-directed and they're just going to be using that housing plan. And the next one bucket is to navigate. So what are all those pieces that are going to happen to help locate, secure, and have someone moved into housing? So once you have your buckets, you can look at your list and figure out how many people are currently in each of those buckets. And then when you get really pro, you can start to calculate the average length of time it's taking for people to move between these buckets and then think about you know, what can we do or try that would reduce that length of time? So again, this whole idea of buckets, 
uh, there is a tool for that. There is a presentation that will help you think about this and understand it more deeply. So the next thing is making sure you have action fields on your by name list. So does your by name list uh, beyond the client info, does it include these process buckets? Do you have a bit of a drop down? Uh, are you able to pull whether which bucket people are in assessment, match or navigate? What is that current system barrier? What is the next step? Who will do it by when? And what's that target move in date to permanent housing? Again, there's some resources. There's a binding list template from the US with fields curated for action and analytics. And also the Canadian Alliance has a binding list Excel workbook template and a guide that goes with that. Uh, some of those fields are in there, but these are customizable documents where you can add in the fields as you need that makes sense for your community. So how do you take all of those things and actually make that play out in a meeting? We're gonna show you some sample agendas, but one of the things I would say about those agendas is they are not, um, they are just sort of templates. Uh, it will probably, your agendas will probably evolve over time. It will depend on how you have split out your meetings and what's you know important to you at the time. Not every meeting may look exactly the same. But here is an example of a 70 minute meeting that includes introduction and team strengthening, goal statement and meeting framing, data share out and celebrating wins, the bulk of the meeting around generating client housing plans. You may include announcements. You wanna make sure those are at the end so it doesn't take up your whole meeting at the beginning. And importantly, you wanna lock in those next action steps. And I'm curious in looking and having you look at this agenda again, is there anything that sort of stands out for you or that you have questions about or you think is particularly interesting? And Lisa, as people are chatting those into the chat, I will ask you to uh, let me know what you see people saying. Mm -hmm. Anything in this agenda that you think is interesting or stands out for you? I'm not seeing anyone uh, put in the chat, but we do have quite a few uh, questions in the Q&A panel. Um, mm -hmm. So I just want to say if we don't get to your questions today, if for any reason we don't uh, get to any of your questions, more than happy to follow up um, afterwards. So I do see some folks uh, writing into the chat um, about the pre-plan of who will be discussed and, and uh, Rain is saying how important that is and I completely agree. Um, pre-planning before the meeting can really go a long way. Um, and same with Teresa, she's saying pre-plan around the data. That's kind of what's standing out for uh, Teresa in terms of this agenda. Um, yeah, and also Denise is saying that she typically hasn't been sharing move-in and move-outs um, with their coordinated access group, but uh, she's thinking of incorporating that from now on, which is great. And uh, also 70 minutes is a good idea because 60 minutes is the most common. So, so adding a bit more time uh, to the agenda is a, is a good idea for Sage. Um, Alex is celebrating the fact that they are celebrating wins in this agenda, which, which is always great. Leaning on those bright spots since this can be incredibly taxing and challenging work. Um, and then also some echoing in terms of the importance of pre-planning and planning and kind of getting your data prepared before you enter into the meeting space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are, those are great comments. And I will let folks know we are going to be having time for sure at the end for questions and comments from people. Like I said, I'm really interested to hear from those people who feel like their meeting is awesome and they've, I'm imagining you have some things to share. I think something that I had someone comment on before is like, oh, I thought we would just be spending all the time talking about clients. And it has just been iterated in the US 
about how important some of this upfront team building and sort of framing the agenda uh, can be to kind of building your team and your, your sort of problem solving um, sort of norms within the group. And so that, that goes a long way, some of that team building and to not forget about it. So that is one sample. You can mix it up. So it's not to say every meeting would have to look like that. I have heard of meetings and I know we're not meeting in person now, uh, but that, um, you know, they might do one in person and then three virtual or vice versa. They might make one meeting a month or every two months more administrative where they go back over their terms of reference and take care of some items like that. I've heard of people who put their meeting right before lunch or they set that 70 minute meeting to give people a little bit time after if they wanna hang around and they have some other coordinating to do or things to talk about if this is the only time people are kind of coming together in the community. You might have a meeting where you do a real engagement and think about you know, of everyone in the table and doing some brainstorming uh, together around some specific topics. So it's not to say they're all going to look the same, but also that this is really difficult work and you're probably not going to, you know, nail the, your, the way you're structuring your meeting right from the beginning, but to give something and give it a try, it's going to evolve, it's going to look a little bit different in your community. And all of that is great. I did want to just mention to the idea of doing service coordination with clients at the table that really that can um, have a lot of value but that is a whole other process this idea that you would have really typically what might be uh, a meeting with one client with really tailored attendance for that person um, as you're working to coordinate services for them and it takes you know uh, some advanced preparation to make that kind of meeting happen. Um, but it can be really valuable, particularly once folks have moved into housing or if you're trying to coordinate because there are a lot of different service providers involved and that this is a great resource to help with that. So the Canadian Observatory's Making Zero Count Service Coordination Handbook, if you're looking at holding a meeting that looks more like that. Just wanted to make you aware of that resource. So once you have sort of set the meeting up like that, uh, you really want to build in improvement. And you've seen some of that as we've gone through. Um, I think that the learning loop and the target move-in dates and the buckets are really ways to kind of build in action and improvement. You can think about that model for improvement, trying some things out or some changes using a plan, do, study, act process. Uh, but I did want to introduce you to the idea of a case conferencing tally sheet and also to let you know that there was an entire presentation just about how to measure the results of your meeting. So this case conferencing tally sheet has dates along the top, meeting one, two, three, four. So this might cover a month's worth of meetings. And down the left hand side, how many clients were you able to discuss of those discussed for how many were the, was there an action step with the due date? How many had target move-in dates? Um, how many action steps ended up being completed after the last meeting? What changes did we try today? And next time, what changes should we try to raise the above number? So what is a really simple way you can set up and make it easy to kind of capture some of these process measures to help improve your meeting? And the facilitator could fill this out or uh, you know, you do it as a group in your meeting to help really draw attention to these items. And, you know, we watched a presentation where they showed an example from a community and the numbers as they got started were not astronomical. Maybe they talked about eight clients and only two of them left with action steps, but that helped them sort of see that and think about, you know, what can we do next time to improve that? Uh, maybe you do this at every meeting or maybe you do it for a month and then take a break for a few months and then, you know, just check in on how you're doing again, bring it back and try it out again for a month. So the case conferencing tally sheet is a resource. You can also measure your experiential objectives and that could be, you could add some questions to your tally sheet or you could create an experiential tally sheet, you know, how many times did people laugh? Did everybody talk? Did we end on time? Some of those things that you identified as your experiential objectives. 
But really the best way to collect that qualitative feedback is going to be to talk with people to ensure that you're really building that coalition. And the best way to do that is talk one-on-one -on -one and really ask people how both they and their clients are benefiting from participating in case conferencing. And you can get curious about those people who don't speak up or stop coming and you might want to follow up with them or people who in meetings often interrupt or take the conversation off course to kind of follow up with them and see what's going on. So this next section is uh, quite short, and I forgot to mention at the beginning of this last section that that was taking uh, 13 tools and nine uh, case conferencing summit presentations and kind of combining it all together uh, into this piece where we've walked through each of these steps. And so it is uh, fast. We're not going into a lot of detail, but really wanted to point you to the resources where you can get more detail. So this is the last section and there's just a few slides and then we're going to get to questions. Um, so step five is really facilitating for action and you want to recruit uh, some particular roles into your meeting. One is a facilitator. Uh, you want that person to have some good facilitation skills, to be able to set the right tone, to house, have a housing first orientation, to know the services in your community and to be really sort of action focused. Uh, oriented facilitators. So selecting the right facilitator is important. It's not to say that someone can't grow or, or receive further training in that role, but uh, it's great if you can get someone who can serve that facilitator kind of neutral role in your group. You're also going to want to look for someone different to be the scribe to make sure all those learning loop fields are filled out in the binding list and to have someone who serves as timekeeper to ensure things keep moving along and the meeting ends on time. And then there are a number of resources to be a power facilitator tools and then a number of presentations that they did. Um, you know, and I think not just for facilitators, but they talked about frontline staff, like how everyone at that meeting can make it theirs, how you do that inner work to really become a movement leader. So you can check those resources out further. And this is really just a sample of some of the things that you will see in those resources. Um, thinking about how you really build that as a space that everyone owns um, and framing out your roles. Um, some strategies that you can employ as a facilitator. And then you also might want to be familiar with some of the common challenges that come up at a case conferencing table. And for those that have been part of or facilitated, you've probably seen some of these challenges. There's three slides like this, and I'm not going to go over them, but I sort of leave them here for you to follow up with if this is an area you want to look at further. So the different challenges and some ideas to overcome these challenges. And I think just to end off by really saying don't get discouraged that these are really kind of big changes um, that you're making to processes in your community um, and away from maybe ways things have typically happened that you're really changing human behavior and it takes time for those new habits to form. And that I fully believe every one of you can become complete case conferencing ninjas. And I'm wondering if you can now put into the chat uh, something that you're going to take away from this that you are going to try out in your community and by when. So based on what you've heard, what is something that you think you can do next to move forward or improve case conferencing in your community? And by when will you do it? And Lisa, without necessarily sharing the names out, but just what are you seeing people put into the chat there? Some next steps that they're thinking of taking. I'm not seeing anything yet. Um, perhaps, uh, perhaps some other participants are like me. I'm very excited about several goodies in this in this presentation. Um, for, for me, I really like the addition of putting experiential objectives and also sharing different measures or improvement efforts that you're doing with the entirety of your case conferencing group because that can really involve and engage others into the improvement mindset and into a mindset of continually trying to improve your 
um, case conferencing table. So I do see some folks uh, writing into the chat. Um, folks are excited to access the resources that we've posted and, and that will be available through the presentation. Um, also the emphasis on action rather than talk. Um, how can we kind of get unstuck from just continually talking about clients and really making it action focused. Um, also, um, the heaps of tools that will be good to prep for case conferencing or give some ideas around improvement efforts. Um, and then also bringing back learnings from this webinar to other members of their team. And uh, also hoping to implement some of these changes by the end of next year or to have a case conferencing table up and running um, by that time. Amazing. And uh, Lisa is going to put uh, the feedback, just five short questions into the chat. If people can take a moment to do that while we're answering some of the questions. And I see we've pushed up on the time a little bit more than I thought, but we'll stay on just a little bit longer to answer um, some of those questions. And if you have to go, then you can come back to the, to the, um, to the recording to, to hear the answers to those questions. So Lisa, I don't know if you can just let us know what some of those questions are as well. I was just talking for a good 30 seconds and I was muted. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so we did have some questions come through the chat as well as the Q&A panel. So I'll start with some uh, that came through the chat. And one was, um, Specifically speaking to some of the successes that U.S. communities have, how were the frontline staff able to change their mindset or what was the key in having those staff really shift their mindset in terms of the U.S. experience and case conferencing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Lisa, you attended all of that. And uh, so, you know, I would encourage you to jump in to answer that as well. You know, I think just... You know, what I heard from folks was the idea of, you know, having some goals and shifting that to be a real learning meeting rather than an update meeting. Again, I think that was a lot of what people were coming. It was updating. It didn't feel necessarily uh, super collaborative or productive. Uh, and so thinking, moving from that shift of kind of client uh, barriers to system barriers, keeping it more action oriented uh, was where some of those mindsets really shifted. Yeah, absolutely. And I just add to that answer. Um, I think just slowly over time, becoming more and more committed to shifting. Um, because in order to make this a meeting that the folks were really, really excited about and really wanted to attend each week, they continually checked in, the facilitators continually checked in with participants to see um, what would make this, you know, a better meeting, how can we continually shift and improve how are we doing in terms of our experiential and meeting objectives? Um, so just being able to uh, shift that through um, listening to what is needed in terms of your case conferencing table and the participants, and then really leaning in to that, um, because what you put in is what you're going to get out as well. Um, I do have another question here uh, that came through the chat. I'm um, wondering about how the case conferencing team lines up with the lead agency assignment on the binding list. Hmm, not sure that I understand that question. Do you understand? What do you think they're getting at there, Lisa? I think... Um, I think, um, I think this speaks to a little bit of uh, participation, like who attends the table perhaps from the lead agency uh, in terms of who will have that kind of lead of, of the person on the by name list who's assigned. Um, so maybe I would just suggest leaning into the resources uh, that were in the middle of the presentation around like uh, participation from providers and uh, sample agendas, because that might help you identify how the team, uh, the case conferencing team lines up with who's the lead agency or the person um, that's assigned to be the lead agency on the by name list. Yeah. 
I do have another question here as well. Um, and just stop me, Marie, if, if uh, we can't get to all the questions, more than happy to answer them at a different time. But I have another question. Um, how do you decide who to talk about each week? And how is that communicated to the facilitator and the case conferencing team? Mm -hmm. You know, and I think we may have ended up addressing that partly through the presentation in terms of some of that prioritization of who to talk about, but perhaps it's generated from the group or from the data on your binding list. Um, if you have priorities and then you're pulling folks down uh, that you think you're going to talk about, um, again, it could be something that happens at the end of the meeting when you're thinking about who, you know, who do we need to talk about next? And it might include some follow-up from the previous week, as well as some new folks that you haven't yet talked about. Uh, and have seen that go out in, you know, the different kind of confidential ways that you'd say that, whether it's a unique identifier that ends up on the agenda or whether there's another confidential way uh, that you have looked to share your agenda within your community. Yeah, absolutely. And I'd also recommend uh, revisiting slide 43. That's the decision tree um, that Marie briefly went through in terms of how to kind of set up your meeting and who to who to talk about in terms of uh, your case conferencing meeting. So I'd suggest revisiting uh, slide 43. I think that will be helpful uh, in terms of your question. Also, I have another question. How do you handle when you are talking about people that not everyone at the meeting should be hearing private information about? Yeah, and I think it goes a little bit to how you've set that consent up at the beginning and, and who you have around the table, you know, having a role with those folks. But again, you could separate it out um, you know, if you have, you know, you're talking about youth, but there's some people who don't need to be at the table because they're not serving youth, then maybe they come a little bit later in the meeting, or that's a separate meeting, you know, or they step out. But again, we're not looking at sharing a, a lot of client details. We're really focused on some of those system next steps that need to be taken is sort of the idea in the meeting. But there are a number of different ways to kind of think about how you might organize your meeting in order to minimize, you know, unnecessary information being shared. Absolutely. Um, so I do have another question here about, um, is it okay to talk about someone who is already housed if they are at risk of losing their housing without wraparound supports? Yeah, and I'm curious from the people that say we have awesome case conferencing, like we'd love for you to like chat in or weigh in on those conversations as well. Um, you know, I think that does happen for some people. You may on your by name list have a, you know, kind of a precarious housed column that you're keeping your eye on. And perhaps that is one of the things that you brought forward to the meeting. Again, I think you need to make this meeting yours. And if there isn't another table where you're talking about prevention kind of efforts, and this is the place to have that, that you might look at that as well. Yeah, absolutely. And you might choose to make, you know, every third or fourth meeting focused on a different topics, such as those who uh, may be facing some housing instability and, and are close to losing their housing. Um, so you could switch up that agenda. So that way you're not kind of talking about that the same each week. Um, but really shifting to make sure you can cover different topics, even if that's not the regular agenda, even if that only happens every X amount of meetings or, you know, once every two months or whatever the frequency might be. Um, I also have a question about if there's any recommendations for case conferencing in areas that have a zero vacancy rate with severe housing shortages. It's hard to make predictions on a target move-in date and this can be emotionally taxing on support people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, and I think this is a, a challenge that, you know, I can't think of a community where, you know, housing availability isn't kind of an issue on the agenda. And it's doing, you know, 
again, I think this is all about sort of those housing option problem solving uh, that can happen and people have been doing some unique things around, uh, you know, house sharing um, and whatnot. But yeah, that will be a challenge. And as you look at those buckets and if you see folks are getting kind of hung up in those buckets, I think, you know, this is a group of frontline services. Do you have sort of a uh, parking lot where you are sort of listing these system barriers that are outside of uh, your control that you can lift up to others in your community. So, I mean, I think that's another opportunity of this table is to be able to share that data and specifically where some of those barriers are happening. But, um, you know, all of those communities where they've driven down those numbers, they also had challenging vacancy rates. That is just, I think, the norm pretty much in every community. Yeah, and I also think it might, you might get some different results if you set up a specific meeting to talk about this. So if you set up a specific case conferencing meeting where you know that part of the meeting is going to be working through some of the challenges related to the vacancy rate, um, you can, if you kind of share that out with providers and try to create a space that's really solution focused, you might get some uh, opportunities that you, didn't think of before. And it's even helpful to share those frustrations um, sometimes in order to give them time for folks to reflect and then be able to um, be a bit more ready to move towards some solutions or think about some potential creative solutions to overcome those barriers. And maybe that's not on a system-wide level, maybe that's on a more of an individual basis, which can then illuminate some other ideas that you have to tackle things like a shortage uh, in vacancies a bit um, on a broader scale. And then um, also seeing a question here, uh, any tips on how to promote buy-in among potential case conferencing community partners to ensure they see the benefits and necessity of participation in these case conferencing meetings? Yeah, and you know, I think as with all these questions, I turn it back to the group if there's folks who want to chat in some answers that they would have to these questions. Uh, yeah, we would welcome and appreciate and we can lift those things up. Um, you know, I think that idea of uh, being able to share out some of what other communities have experienced can, can sometimes be helpful. I think the buy-in around having them help to develop again, those goals and uh, objectives and things around the table. Um, and I think also sometimes people might not immediately see the benefit until they start participating. And then maybe a provider that has not yet engaged, you know, there might be someone from another agency, uh, people who become kind of champions at the table who can share that out with others, the benefit that they're getting from it. But I think, again, I just, I get so excited when I hear about, like, people have transformed, you know, this work in their community such that it is, like, the best and most important meeting that people feel they can go to. I think as people see that coming together is making it easier to house folks and it's helping make it happen faster. I mean, that's sort of the proof in the pudding. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I have two more questions. Uh, the second last one is, is your, if your community has a zero vacancy rate, would it be possible to try housing clients in other communities and how might you coordinate this? Like a multi-community case conferencing table. That's super interesting, hey? Yeah. and. I think, you know, I've heard of communities that have talked about for whatever reason people need to move out of their community and yeah, can you be in touch with those service managers or sort of key planning tables or, you know, does a neighboring community also have a case conferencing table where you might be able to share, uh, you know, some of that kind of back and forth. That's an interesting, it's an interesting idea. Yeah, absolutely. And I see, you know, maybe some um, 
the possibility, the greater possibility for this in some rural areas where perhaps services are a bit spread out between uh, different smaller municipalities? How can you kind of come together, especially if folks um, routinely bounce around to different uh, communities that are kind of within the same area? Um, so I could see having a case conferencing table for each of those like close municipalities. Um, that might be something uh, to consider as you work through uh, how you kind of make up and structure your case conferencing table. Uh, and the last question that I have is, can you describe uh, when it would be helpful to connect with other case conferencing tables that are not coordinated access focused. And so I think this comes from the coordinated access scorecard under the advanced section. We do mm -hmm. ask communities to connect with other case conferencing tables um, throughout the community. So maybe you could describe a bit when this would be helpful to kind of link into those other tables. Mm -hmm. Like what I've heard from some communities, and again, it depends on the size of your community and how things are set up, but sometimes there are multiple tables that are all discussing the same people. Um, and sometimes the same people might be going to multiple meetings. And so how can you kind of map that out to reduce duplication and figure out, you know, what, what table is discussing what, you know, uh, part of an issue or, you know, if at one particular table, what they're really you know, challenged with is a housing issue. How does that come to the case conferencing table for problem solving? And if there's other issues, you need to hook back to the other table on that you can do that. But again, it's to kind of streamline and reduce duplication uh, in the meeting or not having people having a bunch of housing conversations outside the coordinated access table where perhaps uh, you can streamline that conversation. So I'm not seeing any more questions. Um, just wanted to say thank you everyone for such awesome and helpful questions to really help others on the line start to think about some logistics and things or spots that they can dive into in the area of case conferencing. So really great questions. Thanks so much everyone. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Really appreciate everyone being on um, and raising up uh, your thoughts. I think this was really just an introduction uh, and pointing you to some resources and uh, we'll see how else we might be able to lift up this topic as we move forward. And we'd love to hear back on how it's going for you. So thanks everyone again. Sorry to keep you over time. Appreciate people who've been able to stay on. Uh, Lisa's put the feedback form into the chat there if you can quickly open it up and uh, just quickly answer five quick questions. We'd super appreciate it. Um, and have a great rest of your day. Bye now.